Thanks very much, Avik. So funnily enough, this, is, uh, this talk is partly about how I'm finding my way gradually back to physics-y things, but we'll, we'll see that as it comes up. So why does deep learning work? Uh, this is an interesting question to think about, and an important one, I think, um, and one that isn't very, that really that well understood. If you, uh, when you start learning about deep learning, what you're going to see is an equation like this, and you'll see lots of pictures about how you know, this is actually a simulation or a model of neurons in the brain and so on. Um, I think you should forget all of that. Just throw it out, delete it, forget it. It's, it's worthless. Uh, forget this formula. It's not that special. Um, but there is something special uh, that's important here, and that's the fact that with this formula, we can very easily calculate this thing, dy by dx, uh, the gradient. Um, now, it's 8 p.m. I'm not going to do a very mathematical talk or go into any very deep technical details here. Really, this is just an intuitive concept. It's how will a small change in my input, the input to my function, my model, whatever, change the output? And you can see why this is a very useful uh, idea when you're doing something like machine learning, supervised learning. Really, what you have is a target output, the digit three, or you know, a classification of a species of a cat. You want the output that you have to look closer to the real ground truth output. And so how do you work that out? You get a gradient. So really, that's a very simple idea. But the idea of a gradient in this sense actually generalizes uh, well beyond just this simple like matrix multiply formula. So to pick an example of that, more or less at random, let's say we have something like a trebuchet. This has very little to do with matrix multiplication. But you can see that the idea of a gradient makes sense here. If we change the angle of the trebuchet and where we're shooting, then the distance that we achieve with the, with the projectile is going to change by some small amount. It might go up, it might go down. The gradient tells us that. Um, how do we get that gradient? Well, that's another problem that's uh, interesting and technical. But uh, if we could get it, what could we do with that? Uh, it doesn't look that much like a deep learning model, but maybe there's some deep relationship with deep learning that we haven't understood yet. So let's talk about that a bit more. I'm basically going to show you that you can differentiate programs like this and that it leads to some really interesting things. So my first example of this is the simplest. Um, and it's the idea of differentiating an ODE solver. So let's say we have something like this. I better zoom in a bit. Imagine that we have recorded this kind of data from a biological ecosystem. Every day we go in and record the population of the rabbits and the wolves. And you'll see a pan here, which we assume is down to the fact that uh, there's kind of an oscillation because what happens is the wolves eat all the rabbits, then the wolves run out of food, so all the wolves die out. Now the rabbits aren't being eaten, so their population explodes, and so on, and this oscillation repeats over time. We could fit something like this with a neural network and try and predict how the, how the populations are going to change in future as well. But instead of doing that, Let's look at this equation here, which is Locke Volterra. So this is a known kind of a differential equation that's used to model this, uh, this stuff in, in biology. Um, again, very little relationship to the kind of multilayer perceptron you're used to in deep learning. This only has four parameters. It's a very small model by machine learning standards. Um, and actually, the way we get this complex behavior is by integrating it over time. But again, it turns out we can differentiate this. So, uh, what we're going to do is take a guess at what those parameters are and plot it. And it turns out our initial guess isn't very good. The red and blue lines are nowhere near the red and blue dots. But I can take this, this parameter guess, uh, I can take the usual atom optimizer and the usual flux training loop, and I can optimize these parameters. One nice thing about this is that you also get a very nice, strong, intuitive sense of how the atom optimizer is working. Uh, oscillating back and forth a little, as you can see. So again, this isn't something that's like, an, like a multi-layer perceptron, like a deep learning model. Uh, it's much simpler. It has a lot more structure. It has a lot more problem structure. But it's able to very, very quickly uh, work out what's going on in this ecosystem, because we've given it some information up front. And that's going to be a theme of this. Uh, let's try another example. Uh, to go back to the trebuchet I showed earlier. So we're going to do something similar here, where we can differentiate through the trebuchet to, get the, uh, to go from the distance we, we achieved back to a change in the angle that helped us achieve something closer to the distance that we wanted. 
But this time we're going to do something in more interesting, which is to stack this with a normal neural network. You can think of this as being like a sequence in PyTorch. Um, you're just stacking one layer with another. It just happens that one layer is another neural network and one layer is a trebuchet simulator. Uh, we do the forward pass. We give, some, so we give a target to the model. The target predicts the angle that you should use to, for release. Uh, the simulator runs and gets, works out the actual distance. We have a loss function, which is just the distance minus the actual distance we achieved. Uh, and then we backpropagate. We backpropagate the whole thing. We work out what the change in the angle should be. And therefore, we work out what the change in the weights of the neural network should be. And this works. So you can see that when we start out with a random neural network, with a random multi-layer perceptron, it's, it's not giving us a great, uh, well, it's more or less random, right? It's picking, a ra it's picking a random angle and running with it. So when we start, we don't get something that's very close to the target. But uh, after about five minutes of training on a single core of this laptop, you get something more like this. And the, uh, the neural network control is able to look at those parameters and say, well, what do I need to do to hit this target? Set, that, set the angle, set the weight, and hit the target pretty much spot on. Something interesting you can also do with this is to actually uh, try and play with the model a bit by giving it, for example, a very strong headwind and seeing if it can still aim the, the projectile correctly. So for example, in this version, I've actually put a wind speed of minus 10 meters per second. So there's a very strong headwind coming back uh, to push the target back. And the model is smart enough to actually just throw the uh, projectile forward into the wind um, so that it lands still in the right place. And it's not quite exactly 60 meters, which is a target, but it's only off by 15 centimeters. So being able to differentiate through this model gets us a very impressive uh, level of accuracy in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, one more example which is the car pole. So the trebuchet might seem like it's kind of set up to be an ideal case for this kind of approach. But the car pole is a, is a more standard model in deep learning, which already has like quite well-developed approaches to, to solving it. So the car pole problem is something like this, where you have a car and you have a, a big wooden rod that you're balancing. And you have to move left and right so that as the pole, pod, uh, the pole falls over, you are trying to keep it upright and uh, make sure it isn't moving around too much. This is a trained model. What it looks like if you start training, you know, the, at the very beginning, is more like this. So the challenge is to start with something like this and end up with something that has the right behavior. And there are ways of doing this. Um, but so the way you would normally do this is you have like this black box function, which is the car pole simulator, and you have kind of this very coarse grained, you know, did you get it right or did you get it wrong, uh, which you use for uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. But we can do something very similar to the trebuchet, where we start with parameters of the environment that the, the, the model can see, output a decision, left or right, uh, end up with a cost, which is the angle from the, from the center, and then backpropagate again through the whole thing. And I want to show you this training. So we define this chain of dense layers, very simple neural network um, that we want to use. Uh, define how we get an action from the state, the, the state of the environment, the angle of the rod, and, and, where it's, uh, and how it's traveling. We define our optimizer, and then we train. And we just trained carp pole and solved the problem in about under a second. Uh, it's extremely fast. Most reinforcement learning approaches take something like uh, 400 iterations to solve this problem. Whereas by differentiating through the environment, we can get extra information that lets us solve it in only six episodes. So yeah, um, this is an important future direction in machine learning. Taking things like scientific uh, models, which have a lot of knowledge about how, say, particle physics works, and incorporating that into our, different, into our deep learning models, um, which is extremely powerful. And it's, it's the way to apply deep learning to problems um, where you know, either interpretability or sheer computational requirements are an issue, which is a lot of places. Uh, deep learning can be applied in, you know, to, on its own to building a drone flight path panel um, or like a self-driving car because you have to be able to analyze that code and realize that, it's, uh, and realize that it's doing something sensible in all the situations you apply it to. But you also can't just use normal programming with if branches because like, the, the problem is just too complex. So you need somewhere in the middle and that's what uh, this kind of field of differentiable programming uh, provides. A couple other quick examples. So one is ray tracing. Um, we can differentiate a ray tracer, not just, a, not just a physics simulation, but also things like this. And the reason this is cool is because uh, it's based on the insight that computer vision is effectively an inverse problem. Uh, 
we can either take, go from you know, a description of a scene to a rendering of pixels of the screen, or we can go the other way and say, well, here are the pixels. What does the scene look like? And differentiable rendering allows us to basically um, train a computer vision model um, in a similar way to the trebuchet, where we set parameters up front and then backpropagate through the whole network, including you know, how does the scene change if I change this pixel and so on. Um, and then understand, like have a much deeper understanding of how those two things map together and really accelerate uh, computer vision training. You can even apply this to quantum computing. So uh, a quantum computing is uh, formalized as a set of unitary complex matrices applied to a, uh, an input state, which is also a vector of complex numbers. These details don't really matter too much, except that there's a, a trick in which you parameterize a quantum circuit by a real vector and you get out a real vector via the expectation, so no complex numbers involved, that, that's something you can define derivative for. And then you can have a quantum computer as part of your, your differentiable program, uh, your deep learning model. That's it, now you understand quantum machine learning. Uh, no one knows if this is gonna work yet, but that's something we have to build a quantum computer to find out, unfortunately. But Flux will be the first, I promise. Um, and just to show this is not just something for toy demos, this is something we're working on um, in, a, in a drug study. So pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, um, which basically amounts to how does, the, how does a, a drug that you take interact with your body, with your chemical system over time. And that's an ODE, something that's modeled as, as a differential equation. And similarly here, we can go from something like patient data, which we know about, but it's very complex, to something simple that we don't know, like for example, what's the half-life of this drug in your system? Um, and then eventually you take that all the way to something like a treatment outcome. And we can train this on data where the model you know, knows about something about um, how drugs interact with the body, and then get a model that is very easily able to not only predict uh, the right kind of treatment parameters, such as how, how regularly you should take a pill, um, but also things like these half-lives which aren't explicitly in the data. Um, so that lets you do some very cool things. Finally, I'll talk briefly about uh, how, how we make this work. So as mentioned, it's a language called Julia, and it's a machine learning library within that called Flux. Um, and there are three basic ideas which I think I've overviewed um, a fair bit you know, during the break. Um, but basically it boils down to firstly writing everything in one high level language. No, no calling out to sundials to C code for our different equation solvers. We have to have those in one language. Could be Swift, could be Julia, but in our case it's obviously Julia. Then AD. AD is the process by which we get gradients. It turns out that you can just apply the chain rule to any of these programs and you can very, very efficiently get gradients out of even something like a, an ODE solver. Um, and we're able to do that even when you have control flow, even when you have data structures, dictionaries. Um, so that, that makes, that's you know, another key ingredient for this. And then powerful compilation. We want this to be fast. We want it to work everywhere that you can run machine learning models, whether that's TPUs or homomorphically encrypted circuits or anything else you might be interested in. The Julia language I talked briefly about, very simple. You write your code in an obvious pseudocode-like way, but this will also be fast. Um, and writing things this way really does work. Uh, where TensorFlow and PyTorch are about a, f a couple million lines, I think, of C++ code, uh, and Python code and Go code and various other things, the entire Flux stack, including our CUDA kernels, is all uh, about a few thousand lines of Julia code, and it's very, very easy to understand because it's all written the same way that you would write your code and your layers. So you can jump in there and you can understand how to do everything that I've done here uh, very straightforwardly. Uh, the examples, by the way, are also open source. Uh, brief discussion of how we do this. So we have an eager piece of code, like the power function. The power function could stand in for a more complex model, um, like, a, like an R and N, but it's really just something to show you that the absolute basics of how this works, because all of the logic is the same. What this looks like from our perspective, the static graph I talked about, is something like this. And it's basically just, you know, it's a graph where we have a series of operations with inputs, just like in TensorFlow, except that we have generalized this with control flow. We have branches, just like in assembly code. Um, and this is what allows us to target various pieces of hardware. We can take this and we can take this expression and generate, just like TensorFlow does, an expression that calculates a derivative. We can also feed this to something like LLVM, a compiler infrastructure, and get very fast code for that. So that's how we get derivatives faster than everyone else. 
we can compile to the GPU, which means you can take uh, code you wrote, you can, you can program CUDA uh, GPUs from a Jupyter notebook, you can write kernels in Julia, um, it's all the same idea, we just take that static graph, that IR, and take it through to, uh, to NVIDIA's PTX format, and same for TPUs, all very straightforward. Build your model, differentiate it, the same stuff, we just compile and run on a TPU, uh, which is very hard to do, and it's hard to do in, in most frameworks, but happens to be quite easy for us. And finally, another compiler problem that we can see is targeting hardware backend is uh, targeting JavaScript. <coughs> so sure enough, if we go to the Flux website, which is actually here, and if you're interested, you should come here, take a look at the demos and try things like the MNIST classifier, uh, which is able to run a Flux model right here on, on the browser. And it works very well now, despite my, uh, despite the handwriting I have while using this trackpad. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned a couple of other efforts. Like I said, we're not the only people to realize this problem. There are projects like Swift for TensorFlow, <clears throat> projects like Mir. So even Google is saying, no, Python isn't really the ideal solution for this. And they're saying we have to build something new that act as a front end to TensorFlow without graph building. It has to just compile your code straight to TensorFlow. And that's what Swift for TensorFlow is for. Uh, if you want to check out more, uh, go to the Julia website, go to the Fox website, check out the blog post we have. We have loads of detail on models exactly like this and what you can do with, do with them. If you want to work on stuff like this, I want to help people start using this stuff and, and exploiting it more um, because it's kind of a very underexplored and wide open kind of subfield of deep learning that you know, people will need to start getting papers out for. Other than that, grab some stickers. We have Flux stickers and Julia stickers, so please do take some home, put them on your laptops, and uh, share them with your friends. Uh, if there are any more questions, I will also happily take those. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, have you tried running it on the IBM? No, we haven't, but we have. Uh, so uh, there's a group in China working on Yao.jl, which is a quantum computing simulator. And it's, I believe it's the fastest one in the world, uh, mainly because they were able to take it and run it on GPUs very easily, which is usually kind of a, an annoying thing to have to, to do. Um, so this is something we're working on, a package that combines Yao with, you know, just for like we have a package defeat flux, we'll probably have something that combines quantum computing simulations with, uh, differential, uh, with differential programming, deep learning, um, and then to experiment with, you know, can a quantum computer actually solve my problem more efficiently than a real computer, normal one? So it's like quantum ML. Yeah, exactly, quantum machine learning, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. This is a better one. There you go. We just take the chain and we say, move this model to the GPU. Um, it's, it's more explicit than something like TensorFlow, but it's very, uh, it gives you a lot of control. So you can build a data pipeline that reads in an image, processes it on the CPU, and then hands it to the GPU at the right point. Uh, so you can really maximize your parallelism that way. But that's, that's how you do it, yeah, when you want to do it, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, just a quick question. Um, so, with this application, yep. um, Jets are part of this one of the tests. Jets are back um, 30 years ago, you were doing really good things. Yeah. That is an excellent idea. <laughs> Wait for it. Yeah, so this is a paper which does exactly this. Um, and the, this is not quite doing what I'm talking about because it doesn't include an actual model of particle physics, um, but it does do something more like a tree RNN where it sees, they basically see uh, part, like the, the jets, um, or you know, the quarks inside them having a kind of a grammar and therefore treating them like an NLP model. Um, 
where you kind of like recursively combine events together and then end up with a with an overall full vector. Um, so that's that's kind of pushing in this direction, yeah. And I'm hoping someone will eventually do one with an actual model of particle physics inside the 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 uh, the model. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a thing, there's a thing like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, in that sense, there's nothing like that clever about deep learning. It's just like something slightly dumber than brute force search that's made feasible by having an enormous amount of GPU and compute power. You know, $25 million if you're deep mind doing StarCraft, right? So uh, the point of this is to actually go towards clever approaches that could, you know, Hopefully, if we really understood how the brain works, for example, we'd be able to do it on a Commodore 64, right? Because the principles probably aren't so complicated, but uh, we just don't know what the right things are. So it's really about doing things which are cleverer. And one clever option is to kind of do a transformation of your program, which also wouldn't have been possible a few years ago, but we can now do transformations that allow us to really speed up uh, the training by incorporating this kind of knowledge. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we should do something like that. We tried to have very general pieces of tooling, so we don't have you know a flux logging framework. We just use Julia's normal logging tooling, and the same thing would probably be true for data loaders. But if there's things we're missing in the ecosystem, then we can, then we you know we, we like to kind of build those things and replace them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So you don't, you know, we have a lot less need for things like a flux compatible JPEG decoder, um, which TensorFlow has, for example. TensorFlow has a whole library of, you know, file readers and CSV passes and like all this other stuff. They're rebuilding the entire Python ecosystem in just for this one framework. Because if you don't do that, if you don't have it as part of the TensorFlow graph, then it's not fast. So the alternative for us is to just say, well, let's just make everything fast. And then, you know, you load an image at the normal Julia way, the same way that someone not doing any machine learning at all would do it, and it's just as fast, it's just as good. Um, and the code is much, much simpler. Yeah. 